Hello and welcome to the first episode of Why Educational Games Should Be Awesome. We're going to dive into the theory and work behind that idea and how that work applies to designing new games. Now this series is really going to be broken into three parts. Why people want to play games, why games are good for teaching people, and why good games are good for changing minds, of which learning is a subset. So these three will sort of build on each other until the end when the goal is to really show why educational games being synonymous with things like this is kind of like symphony being synonymous with things like this rather than things like this. They can be these great experience, but okay, let's start at the beginning. Motivation. And when you talk about the psychology of game design, this is one of the big ones. Why do people play games? Or if you're designing it, how do you get people to want to play your game? And even more so when you put education into the mix, because whether they can articulate it or not, this is what most people actually want out of games and gamification to motivate people. They see gamers paying $60 and more and seeking hundreds and thousands of hours into them. And then they want to know, why do gamers do that? How do I foster that with my content? So let's get into that. Now a lot of people would start by talking about Skinner and Operant Conditioning, which is already a good video of up here, and that'll come up later. But I think a better place to start if you want to talk about game design, especially educational game design, is a theory called self-determination theory. When you hear terms like intrinsic motivation or extrinsic motivation, this is where that's coming from. It draws a distinction between intrinsic motivators, which come from within things like interest, enjoyment, feeling fulfilled, etc. And the extrinsic motivators are things that come from outside, like getting paid, getting otherwise rewarded, fear of punishment, all of those sorts of things. Now what's really cool about self-determination theory is it doesn't just describe motivation, but it talks about how to affect it, and especially it talks about how perception sort of enters into this. Okay, let's have an example. Let's say you're at home watching Firefly. Who doesn't like watching Firefly? It's intrinsically motivating to watch this awesome space western, and no one is paying you to do it. On the other hand, let's say you don't like your job, you're only doing it to get paid. You're being extrinsically motivated by money. It appears your perceptions are accurate in both these cases. Now let's say someone comes and offers to pay you to watch Firefly, and you're all like, heck yeah, free money, of course I'll take your money to watch Firefly. I like doing that anyway. But then the next day, you don't really feel like watching it, but you do because you're being paid to. What can happen, not always happens, but can, is you start watching Firefly less on your own time. Or more importantly, you start wanting to watch it less. You may even say something like, well, I used to like watching Firefly, but now it just feels like work, you know? And this is one thing the theory can speak to. Through the lens and language of self-determination theory, you were intrinsically motivated to perform the task, but by adding an extrinsic motivator, you started to perceive the task less as something you're doing for yourself because you're intrinsically motivated, but something you're doing for someone else in order to get that extrinsic motivator. And this actually explains why trying to motivate someone to do something can make them actually want to do it less on their own. Again, not always, but can. Okay, so that's cool to be able to talk about and to test, but what about the other side? How do we foster intrinsic motivation in a task or topic? How do we make people want to play a particular game? Well, that's where it gets even better. The most common way to foster intrinsic motivation is to actually connect it to something that people are already interested in or already have intrinsic motivation in. And people do this all the time. You've probably done it. Say I have this series that I really enjoy, and I want to share it with someone who I know has no current interest in it, but I do know something that they do like. I'd probably say something like, it's like Firefly, but underwater instead of in space, to try and pique their interest, to create this connection to what they're already motivated to do, to foster motivation to do the new thing. You've probably done this yourself, or had it done to you, like, a lot, and never really stopped to think about it. And you've even seen this in education too. Think about the idea of that really good teacher who individualizes the content for students. Like, say the teacher wants to teach math, and she knows the kids are interested in space. So you show how math can be used to solve rocketry problems, how you need math to do successful launches, how you can use this new thing to achieve the goals that you already have, to do things you're already motivated to do. And here it might actually be stronger than before, because you're not just building an association, you're actually showing how this new skill or knowledge can be used to solve challenges and achieve goals that are relevant to them, specifically. At this point, you can already start to see how the fact a lot of classes arbitrarily say you need to know X because it's on the test that I am going to give you, rather than showing how it's actually useful or relevant to anything the students care about is kind of a huge problem, and this kind of motivational scaffolding is super important, but we'll come back to that later. Right now, I have a bigger challenge for you. Let's say I don't want to just create interest in one person, or even a group with a shared interest, like people who like Firefly, or space, or whatever. Let's say I want to create interest in as many people as possible. How do you do that? 
how do big games do that? I'd love to hear your ideas in the comments, and I'll talk about at least one answer next time.